So I hope that you are now ready to go from 1 to n uh, to make this story also a little bit more useful. So let's take the same ideas and uh, do models and think about now ions in a linear trap. Okay, so what we have in mind is a very un, uh, unisotropic harmonic oscillator corresponding to a, um, a linear trap, ion trap. And we want to put ions inside. You can see they repel each other and there will be an equilibrium distribution. So we just think of this as a classical problem. You know, these things will then sort of form a string and they will form small oscillations around these equilibrium positions. And we will quantize these oscillations now, the following, to make essentially harmonic oscillators out of this thing. This, of course, uh, will be a nonlinear problem initially, but for small oscillations, it will be linear. So a linear trap corresponds to confinement of the motion along x, y, and z. And we want to you know this uh, uh, inequality over here that the x sort of is much softer than the much more stiffer y and z direction. And the equilibrium positions of the ions will be given by the confining forces, which is this big harmonic oscillator, which is somehow soft, and the trapping potential balancing the coolant propulsion between the ions. And of course, we will always assume that we have done laser cooling. Actually, in the case over here, this laser cooling is much more complicated because we'll discuss now in the following that there will be many emotional eigenmodes. It's no longer the simple harmonic oscillator just with one phonon, uh, but there will be many of them, collective modes, and you have to cool, in principle, all of them. Um, and, uh, but let's assume that experimentalists know how to do it, and in practice, they actually do. Okay, and you can also see that what we can do in the system, there will be motion over here, but there will be a collective motion, but we can still shine laser light on these individual ions representing the qubits, and now we have n qubits over here, uh, that are these two-level atoms, the qubits that we want to manipulate, and we can address these things individually, because in a typical ion trap, the distance between them will be of the order of magnitude of a few micron. And uh, this allows one to focus laser light without uh, too much crosstalk between the ions over here. So we have here now uh, the situation, you know, and this is sort of, uh, again, from Rainer Blatt, the picture I've stolen a long time ago, where you can see now the string. In the meantime, I should say the strings have gotten much longer. So Chris Monroe just published a paper where he had 53 of these ions over here. Again, in principle, you know, you can manipulate them, all of them individually, but uh, we will now focus and explain the model um, of how to do gates, for example, just for two ions, because this is a toy model that we can do in a lecture like this here. So um, I think now we can kind of speed up a little bit, because all of the things that we said about single ions is very easy to write down for n, OK? Um, and uh, so when I tell you that we have here a Hamiltonian, uh, first of all, for the motion, you can see this is the first ion in its harmonic oscillator, which is this big new corresponding to this harmonic trap. This is the second ion over here, and now again moving in the harmonic oscillator. What's new is this, that these ions will repel each other, and this is in, in a one-dimensional model, the repulsion between the ions at these positions x1 and x2 uh, here. And uh, you can see that you know, if I drop the kinetic energy over here, this will give rise to a classical equilibrium where these ions distribute in a certain way. And of course, then we have to add for each of these ions, for ion 1 and 2, the internal degrees of freedom. Again, we have here atomic transition frequency. This is the projector to the excited state. That's exactly what we had before. But now for two ions, and uh, over here, when I have a Rabi frequency addressing you know, my first ion over here, it would now be an omega 1, maybe time dependent, e to the i k x. This is the kick on ion number 1. And then we have here again for ion number one, the coupling from the ground to the excited state. So the laser that we shine over here lifts the electron from the ground to the excited state of the first ion. And very similar here for the second ion, this then kicking, of course, the second ion over here. So this is just, I'm writing now twice, you know, what we wrote before. So in this sense, you know, um, you understand all of these things in detail. What we do now is the next step is this, that we want to do now a 1D model for two ions in the trap. 
uh, and we would like to rewrite for very small oscillations about these classical equilibrium positions here, introduce center of mass and relative coordinates, and identify the corresponding eigenmodes of the system. So in the case of two ions, this is very simple. You know, There will be a center of mass mode where the ions sort of go like that. And the corresponding frequency is just a bare trap frequency. And there will also be uh, a mode which is a stretch mode where the ions sort of oscillate against each other and they will have a higher frequency. It turns out that this frequency is uh, square root of three times the, the, uh, the trap frequency. So these two center of mass and the stretch mode they have different frequencies, and of course, if you believe my story from before, we can address, of course, by choosing the appropriate frequency from the laser light, we can we address these different modes that we have over here. So at that point, of course, we are linearizing, you know, this Coulomb interaction that we have over here. And um, if you write down the, the whole story, you can see now that the, uh, the total Hamiltonian is now one where we have small oscillations of the center of mass with the frequency nu. We have this relative motion, which is now square root of three with a stretch mode. Then we have here again in the rotating frame, we have the tuning of the first and the second laser. And then over here we have our Ravi frequencies. And I'm writing now this e to the i k x1. If you go back, uh, this is the term that we had over here. You know, here was e to the x1. Then down here we rewrote this x1 in terms of center of mass and the relative motion x and the little x over here. And this is the connection between them. And here it would be either the capital X and then the lower case okay, here plus and here there's a minus x. Okay? So if I again express these things in terms of lamb Dicke parameters, you can see sort of the obvious. It's exactly what we had before. The story just gets a little bit more complicated because we have more modes and more ions, but there's not really any uh, fundamental new physics which is entering at this point. So uh, I'm not sure how much you know about quantum computing. So does everybody? Yeah. How did you uh, treat the, the Coulomb interaction? The Coulomb oh, we will linearize. Okay, about the classical. So we want the linear oscillators, and actually, it turns out to be a very good approximation. Uh, so we just expand and keep the, the linear terms, and uh, corrections are very small. So you have two, uh, two different uh, harmonic oscillators for the center of mass. And that's right, and so we are going to manipulate now. I mean, the point is really that uh, these modes that we talk about here are collective modes. So by shining, for example, a laser on one ion, we can actually control the collective mode of the ion. So if I, you know, if I uh, have excitement new, then it means that I'm exciting this mode, okay? And if I go to the sideband, the square root three times new, I go to the sideband, which does like that. So by shining a laser on one ion, you can manipulate you know, all of the ions that we have over here uh, according to the mode that they couple to. Okay? So I guess you know all of these things. This only takes uh, five seconds to go through that. And just want to remind me, uh, now we want to do quantum computing with these things. And what we do in a quantum computer is this, that we have a set of qubits. Uh, representing our system and the time evolution. This is your quantum program by some unitary. And as we said before, we would like to decouple uh, or sort of um, uh, re-express this unitary time evolution in terms of single qubit gates and two qubit gates. Um, this is sort of the zero order version and quantum memory is now our spin one halves. This is like in the iron represented by our two level system. Uh, we have superposition here, the entangled states and all of that. And um, uh, what we are aiming for is, on one hand, to do single qubit rotations. And uh, single qubit rotations, actually, with these trapped ions and with most of these systems, are actually very simple. If one is able to address you know, a single ion uh, by a laser, focusing just on a single ion without any crosstalk, you can then apply your Ravi flops exactly in the way that we did before. So single qubit rotations are you know, conceptually rather trivial. But let's focus on the more interesting part, which is the two qubit gate. And I've written down here a C naught gate. It's one example where, for example, you want to do the following. Suppose that you have an ion over here having two internal states in, in the, in the uh, electronic degrees of freedom, and then also over here. And then what you would like to perform, and this is part of these complete gate sets, if you're able to do this and this, you can chain everything together and sort of decompose the general unitary always into them. You would like to perform here, uh, the following uh, operation. So if your control, this is the first one here, is in state zero, you would like to act with nothing. This is just a unit operator on your target. 
But if the first one, your control, is in the state one, you would like to act with a certain unitary. This could be any unitary rotation that you want on the second one. And graphically, you can represent these things here. This is your control. And depending on the state of this control, you apply a certain unitary operation down here, which you specify. So we will do one of these versions of these gates. And by combining all of these things together, in principle, if you have a complete gate set, I will tell you afterwards that Rainer Blatt does it slightly different now in these um, experimental realizations. But uh, uh, let's talk about you know, these kind of entangling gates, because they are very much at the core of all of these ideas. And of course, at the end, we have to do readout and measurement. We'll talk about readout and measurement as a projective measurement tomorrow, um, you know, when we talk about open systems. So this will be excluded for the moment. This is a little bit of a historical figure for me. So in our first paper that we wrote with Ignacio Sirac, we had uh, this figure over here representing electrodes you know, for this string of ions, and then here the motion, and then the laser pulses entangling. So let's have now in mind a model where um, we have uh, all of these ions over here that have, uh, which form actually a quantum register, where you know, the first ion can be the ground or the excited state, this metastable state, the second ground and the excited state, and this is this exponentially large Hilbert space of our qubits. And let's assume that from all of the phonon modes, uh, the ones that we want to manipulate, for example, would be the center of mass modes. In principle, I have to write all of the modes over here. There would be many of them. But let's assume that all of them are cool to the ground state. And we are going to talk about how to manipulate, for example, the center of mass mode. So I'm just keeping one of these modes over here for the following discussion. Uh, notice that uh, this is the quantum register with the internal degree of freedom. And what we have here on the right hand side are the phonons. And this is more like the data bus, you know, that due to the fact that these modes are collective modes, you know, all of them, the ions are oscillating here together. Uh, we are going to essentially perform now gate operations by writing the qubit onto the data bus, uh, go to the second ion, then manipulate it there, and then sort of write it back at the end. And this is the sequence that I would like to explain. To, to explain now the following some details. So this is this complete model, you know, in its most basic form. And you can see that uh, it essentially becomes a quantum control um, problem, because uh, we really have here the qubits that we want to manipulate and to entangle to implement these unitaries I talked about. And we do this thing via the phonons. But at the end of the day, of course, the phonons, we have to clean them up. So at the end, the phonons should factor out from the whole dynamics as they do here at the beginning. And we have to make sure that our co uh, controlled uh, quantum uh, controlled um, uh, dynamics uh, at the end really cleans out that the phonons really factorize out again from, uh, from the whole story. OK, so um, for a change, I'm calling this thing now R. I had some old slides where this thing was called R. This is my qubit over here. And the first thing that I want to add to the story is this. This is my qubit, long lift. Um, all of you will agree that um, atoms have many more levels than only a two-level system. And we are going to use this two-level, this extra level, this third level now in the following to do the gates. So uh, uh, normally, when quantum information people see something like that, what they will tell you is, this, oh, you're violating story because uh, this is not the qubit anymore. But that's exactly the point of the whole story. You know, Real atoms have them, so why not use them? And you will see that in the following, they provide the answers. OK, and then it can, of course, if you think of these as being same and levels, you can address them with different light polarizations here. So in this sense, we can make here our Rabi oscillations or here the Rabi oscillations, uh, depending what uh, kind of a transition you would like to couple to. And of course, we still have this other state around that so far has not entered our discussion for state measurement with quantum jumps, the story we do tomorrow. And uh, let's now sort of go through the gate. And I, at this point, I actually just have to show you a few uh, pictures, and you will immediately understand what it is about, because it's very similar to what we did before with our single ions. Okay. So um, let's do a two-qubit uh, phase gate. Well, afterwards, tell you what it is. It simply means that on one part of the wave function, you will write a minus sign, and uh, it consists now of three steps. And the first step that you want to do is this, that um, I give you, for example, here ions that have all of them have been cooled in the ground state. So it corresponds to the situation that we had over here, that you have here no phonons. OK. And this thing is in a certain superposition state. And now you would like to perform uh, a C0 gate or some entangling gate you know, between uh, two pairs of ions that you can uh, choose. 
So how does that go? Well, the way how it goes is sort of like this, that uh, uh, let's take the, uh, the uh, qubits over here, and I try to represent uh, with a red color when you are in the ground state, and with a green color when you are in the excited state. So if I go, say, to the first atom, which is atom M for me over here, my qubit you know, consists of a superposition of the ground state over here and the excited state, or maybe then, of course, some entangled state of all of them. But let's just focus on this part over here. This qubit will be a superposition of the ground state with no phonon, and the excited state are not, you know, with no phonon. Suppose now that I shine a laser on this thing over here, and uh, the way that I'm shining the laser on this thing over here is to play the trick that we said before. Before we did this little exercise where we asked ourselves the question, if I have an internal qubit, how do I convert this thing to a phonon superposition state? And the answer was, as you remember, that we go to the red sidebands and we are driving a pipe pulse. Okay, so let's do exactly the, the same thing here, that we are driving a pipe pulse that takes the population down here to the state G1 down here. So you can see that now the first qubit, you can see that over here. Uh, here this in the superposition state, here this now in the ground state, which is over here. But the consequence of, is that we have now one phonon in the system, but notice that it is the whole string of the ions over here that will actually be oscillating, okay? So we have written our uh, uh, original superposition or entangled states, our superposition of all of these qubits that were all represented by internal degrees of freedom, uh, that one of these qubits is now in the ground state, factors out, but this information is now stored in the collective mode. And in our case, it is just the center of mass mode of all of these ions that you cover to. So this was the first step, and this is the step that we can sort of say that we are uh, swapping uh, the electronic qubit to the phononic qubit, uh, which acts here then at the end, because all of them oscillate here together as a collective data bus. So let me now go to the second ion, and this is the entangling gate that I would like to perform between ion M and the, uh, and the ion N over here. You can see that if I go to the second ion, uh, the second ion, of course, uh, is still a superposition of the ground and the excited state that you had, uh, like we had before. But at the same time, of course, it is also now, uh, uh, it also is now oscillating, okay? And uh, so in that sense, what we have is now a four-level system. You can see this was sort of the qubit over here vertically, if you want, representing the internal state of the ion N. And what we had originally in the qubit M that was over here is sort of this axis over here because we mapped this thing to the phonon states. So if I just take M and N, you can see the qubit of uh, two times two, this is a four dimensional space. It's a four level system. It's now represented by this four level system over here. And now the task is that in this four level system that we want, would, we would like to do some non-trivial operation, like for example, say, changing the phase you know, of one of these states over here to perform what we call a phase gate. Okay? Uh, how do we do that? Well. Oh, there should be a pi over here. Okay, not a question mark. Okay. Um, how do we do this? Well, at this point, maybe it comes in what I told you before. If I give you a spin one half particle and I do a rotation around two pi, okay, what do I get as a phase fact? I get a minus sign in front of my wave function. And this is exactly what we're going to use now, but notice that we want to write this minus sign of the wave function only for one state and not for all of the other ones. But we had this extra state over here that we called R1. And suppose that I'm applying now a laser pulse, which is on the red sideband, which takes this population up here, couples to the state, and then couples down here. And notice this is on the red sideband. So what happens to the state down here? It's trying to find the sideband over here. But this is already the ground state of the system. There is no phonons with quantum number minus one. So this means that this pulse, which goes over here, this two pi pulse, will not find a state to couple to and actually simply remain in the ground state. In other words, this thing over here gets a minus sign, whereas this thing over here just remains what it was. Okay? Now you can see that we have a superposition of uh, these four states, this one, this one, this one, and this one, but we put the minus sign here in front, and if you write down all these transformations, this is sort of indicated by this truth table, uh, which is down here. So the last thing that remains now is simply that, well, let's clean up the whole story by writing the qubits that we had stored in our, in our phonon state back to the atom number n. So you just do what we did in the first step. You know, in the first step, we did the swap bars on the, on the red sidebands, but now we go with our laser addressing the atom number M, and we again take a laser which is on the red sideband, 
Then I'm again doing a pi pulse, and then I've sort of you know, written now from my phonon uh, back to the atom, and I've cleaned up my phonons completely, and at that point, of course, I've done a gate. You know, and what is the gate? Well, the gate essentially means that you're putting a minus sign over here, and this is something that we call a phase gate, and it's uh, equivalent up to some single particle rotation, so the C naught gates and all of these things, okay? This is a very general concept that you can see over here at work, that we have here a toolbox, you know, consisting of all of these Hamiltonians to manipulate with the ion. We have collective modes uh, where all of these ions participate. And our toolbox, you know, with the lasers allows us to manipulate these individual degrees of freedom that we can ensemble in such a way to perform a quantum task like the one over here. We want to start with zero phonons. But then at the end, sort of, you know, come again out with zero phonons, but achieve, for example, here the quantum task of writing a minus sign that we have over here. Okay? Uh, and you can see that at that point, I didn't really have to write down any formulas anymore because it was sort of so obvious to you that uh, I don't have to, um, you know, convince you, I guess, in more detail. Well, how do these things work? Um, you know, this is sort of historical. They, uh, experimentalists like Rainer Platt and also Dave Weiner, they performed you know, some of these gate operations. As you can see, this is quite long ago, in the year 2003. In the meantime, what has happened is this, that you know, at that point you could publish a nature paper but just doing um, a single gate, okay, with a certain fidelity, which at that point was not actually very high. Uh, but in the meantime, experiments have actually progressed to the point where we would like to be, namely that you want to do these gates with a very high fidelity, and you would like to do these gates uh, also in such a way that you can chain many of them together to perform some non-trivial calculations. And I would like to uh, show you now, and this is sort of now going a little bit more to, the, uh, to this entertainment mode again, you know, where we're not writing serious formulas, but I just want to tell you a little bit of qualitative physics. Uh, to give you just a brief snapshot where we are today, and I will sort of, you know, end this uh, snapshot actually at the very end by uh, showing you results that we are doing right now that I'm very excited about. And at that point, I will ask to switch off the camera here because uh, uh, we have not published these things yet. And uh, so in that sense, uh, I don't want this to be included. We can switch the camera on at the very end when I make a transition to what we'll talk about tomorrow, okay? Okay, you know this story, okay? You have seen that before. And um, sort of here is now an example of uh, you know, the operations that are in Innsbruck implemented. They are doing what's called the Mölmer Sörensen gate. That's a variant of the gate that I described before, which has a very nice property of being an entangling gate that's immune to certain kind of noises. And I'm not going to explain the details behind it. I think the more important part in this whole story is this, that in this Innsbruck quantum computer of uh, Rainer Blatt and Christian Roos, uh, what they have is they have a complete gate set that they can perform and you can sort of steer all of these laser pulses from the outside. And of course, there's several groups uh, out there along the world like uh, Dave Weinland and Chris Monroe, uh, also the ETH and so on, um, as in Oxford, you know, that are able to perform similar kind of gate operations. What has changed over the years is the fact uh, we have um, sort of like little compilers that can be run to uh, implement certain quantum tasks. And I will, you will see this afterwards actually at work. And uh, that the gate fidelity, uh, you know, is actually so high that one is able to do many of these gate operations, as I mentioned before. You can play other games like coupling to the environment and even do quantum reservoir engineering, but that's not what I want to talk about here. So let me show you a few slides that are sort of taking out from, from colloquia that I gave, you know, uh, some time ago that should sort of illustrate you in a certain example the kind of things that one does in the lab. And uh, the example that I would like to choose here is quantum simulation of a many-body system run on a digital quantum computer. And it will sort of illustrate that we put all of these gates together in one big toolbox and assemble that. And we can ask at the end, you know, where we are. So uh, the problem that we want to address here uh, in this uh, somewhat qualitative form was sort of formulated originally by Seth Lloyd in the paper in the 90s uh, that he called digital quantum simulation. The question that he was asking is this. Uh, suppose that you would like to do the task of having a many-body system like spins, and I'm drawing here something in 2D, but of course at the end we map it now to 1D down here. And you have some certain spin dynamics, uh, certain spin Hamiltonian, and you would like to perform a time evolution according to this complicated many-body Hamiltonian that you have. And how do we program this thing on the quantum computer that, uh, that we are doing here? This is the task that we would like to address. Okay. 
And the idea behind these story is this, to do uh, a trotterized, a sort of, you know, a stroboscopic sequence of gates that we have, uh, let me sort of illustrate it here. You can see that with each of the qubits that we have here, we associate now one of the qubits that we have in a string um, uh, of the ions over here, qubits are spins, okay? Uh, and you can see that we can shine laser pulses on these things that at the end amount that this is a single qubit gate, this is a two qubit gate, single qubit gates, and what we would like to do is to sort of decompose all of these things in such a way that the time evolution that comes out corresponds to the many-body Hamiltonian that you sort of have in mind. And let me give you a very simple example to illustrate what I mean. Suppose that this Hamiltonian that I talk over here that I would like to simulate is the almost trivial case here of an Ising model. You can see that these are just spin one half interacting with an Ising interaction, and we apply here a transverse field. Okay. Notice that this is just a single particle term, single particle term, and this is an interaction term over here. So this is the most elementary example that we can invent about an interacting, in this case, just two spin system to illustrate the general idea. Uh, you will also notice that these two parts of the Hamiltonian will not commute. You know, for example, if I take the magnetic field very, very strong, what you will get is that this term will then dominate and you will get uh, a paramagnetic phase where all of the spins will be aligned if you look for the ground state in a certain direction, which is the x direction. Whereas, of course, if I uh, make the b very small and go to a phase where the j is very large, you can see that depending on the sign that you have in front, the ground state of this thing will either be sort of a ferromagnetic type thing or, or an antiferromagnetic uh, type phase. So you have competition here between two Hamiltonians, and the central point is that they do not commute. Uh, so this means if you write down a model like this, this is just a, really the most simple one. Uh, in 1D, you would get the quantum phase transition if I'm changing the parameters from one value here to the other one. But how would you now do time evolution if I give you a many-body Hamiltonian of this type over here? The idea, and sort of reduce it to the gates that we did now earlier, is let's look at the time evolution, e to the minus i h t, and let's decompose this time evolution into small time steps over here. If I take a very small time step over here, in this very small time step, what I can do is I can make, because delta t is by assumption small enough, and there will be certain errors then associated with that, you know that I just write it as the first and the second part of these Hamiltonians. So I'm just pulling these exponentials apart. But of course, these operators will not commute with each other. There will be a certain correction. But notice that this correction will be of higher order than the delta d. So if I make my time step small enough, the so-called trotter errors that I have over here that uh, will only appear if the Hamiltonians do not commute, uh, they will hopefully be small. And this is something that, of course, at the end, you want to check and control. And there maybe are some more clever ways of decomposing this thing. But at that point, you have decomposed your complete time evolution into a sequence of small stroboscopic steps where this first and the second Hamiltonian, all of these acts. But uh, essentially, e to the h1 and h2, this is nothing else but single and two qubit gates in the way that we draw above there. So this means that a time evolution, a quench in a many-body system, can always be decomposed in the trotter sense, you know, in the small time steps. And in each of them, you apply a gate. And it is just the gates that we were talking about before. Yeah? Maybe it's a little bit more complicated, but that's basically what the story is. So this is a great testing ground. Of course, it's a physics problem. So physicists are interested in it. Maybe computer scientists uh, not so much. Yeah? And here's uh, some old stories. And I'm showing this because a few years, this was 2011, where first digital experiments were done. So this is this Ising Hamiltonian that I just showed you, transverse Ising. Here's an XX and then the C in the field over here. And these are different you know, step sizes and uh, comparison theory and experiment. Um, it was at that point, you know, only a very small number, four to six spins. In the meantime, this is done for a much larger number of particles. So that's to some extent a historical plot. But what I want to emphasize is that, you know, you can write down Hamiltonian that nature normally doesn't give you, like, say, a six-body interaction like the one over here. You can just program this thing, you know. So there's nothing secret behind it. Of course, the real secret behind this is, you know, can we scale this up? Uh, what about errors that occur over here? You can see that if you look at the theory and experiment and all of these things, of course, on the level where just a little laptop can do these calculations, you know, um, uh, better than, than your quantum computer. But the hope is, of course, at the end to scale it up and understand all of the errors and so on. Um, let me just tell you where we are at the moment. So we published, for example, a paper last year. And uh, again, I'm not going to explain the details behind these things here to you. 
where we took a model of one-dimensional quantum electrodynamics that has pair creation and all of these things. And to cut sort of a very long story short, this is quantum electrodynamics coupled to matter. One is able to map these kind of models at the end of the day to spin models. It is an ugly spin model. So if there was a competition for the most ugliest spin model in the world, I'm sure that we will win it by, you know, these kind of models that we get out over here. But uh, computers and also quantum computers do not care, you know, if you give them an ugly Hamiltonian. Um, also your physical insight maybe at the very beginning is not entirely clear. Uh, so uh, in collaboration with Rainer Blatt and Christian Roos as the experimentalists, and uh, we had this team of people that in particular involved this guy, this was on the experimental side and this was on the theory side. We programmed this thing and were able in this case to do four trotter steps, you know, uh, sort of in pretty good agreement. So at that point we only had four qubits and only four trotter steps, and I have to tell you the reason why it was only four trotter steps was more related to the fact that the classical control electronics was uh, not uh, you know, big enough or sort of general enough. Uh, in principle, the quantum computer would have been able to do much more, and they will show you afterwards results that go now for much bigger systems, you know, also much, much further, not in the sense of time evolution, but I'll explain that afterwards, okay? Uh, what's interesting in this context, of course, is the fact that uh, 220 quantum gates were part of this thing over here. That's pretty impressive, you know, that uh, within a decade, you know, and this applies to, of course, uh, to many of these iron trap experiments that are out there, that these gate fidelities are so high that without doing error correction, you know, you can do quite a lot of gates. Uh, and I have to tell you, the best way to do error correction is to avoid it, uh, and uh, because there's so much overhead behind these things. That's sort of a little bit an illustration what you can see what happened over the last 10 years, and uh, it's quite amazing. And of course, um, I mentioned at the very beginning this analog simulation with the Hubbard models. Uh, if you don't do gates over here, but you know, on the scale again of 20 to 50 ions, you know, you can engineer by always on interaction that you have certain lasers and they are using now these phonon modes in order to induce effective couplings. You can get, for example, Hamiltonians with spin models over here. Uh, Chris Monroe has done similar experiments along these lines, and there's a similar experiment also in, in Innsbruck by Rainer Blatt and Christian Roos. Uh, the general idea is this that we talked before about all of these kind of modes, and now we talk about transverse modes in the trap, not the longitudinal ones. And uh, you know, there will be center of mass, and there will be different tilts and zigzag mode. If you eliminate these phonon modes in an effective Hamiltonian, you get long range interactions and you get these kind of couplings out here. So, this is an example of getting uh, easy couplings, but now with long range interactions that automatically come out uh, from all of these models. And here's an example of spin dynamics. For example, if you flip one of the spins here and you go to the, uh, to the limit where this Hamiltonian is just a flip flop. What's happening over here, you know, is essentially that you can have a, a situation where all of the spins are down, but the middle one you have up here. But what this thing would like to do is sort of flip flop, you know, and uh, be like a kind of a uh, propagating magnon, if you want to call it. But of course, you know, if I put one spin up, uh, there will be propagation to the right, but there will also be propagation to the to the left. But you only have one excitation in the system, so. Uh, this means that, you know, if my spin on the here is up, it cannot be on the other side, you know, and vice versa. So in other words, there will be entanglement, of course, you know, between the two positions at the spins at these two positions that correspond to this right and left going uh, magnon modes. Yeah? That's, of course, what was exactly seen in this experiment. You can see this magnon sort of propagating out here and the corresponding entanglement, you know, that uh, on these different spins looking further and further out, you know, seeing these EPR correlations, this was exactly seen by this experiment, and there was related work by the Monroe group that did these things for much larger particles. Uh, 